Hi, I'd like to introduce AP Daily. So this is a faculty lecture and my name is Liz Coles. I teach biology and chair the biology department at Eastern Connecticut State University. So I'd like to do a deep dive into protein modifications. So in terms of protein modifications, one of the things we can look at are what are called prosthetic groups. But first, let's take a look at protein structure. So of course, we start with the primary structure, which is the amino acid sequence. And so this is dictated by the nucleotides present in a gene in the DNA. So this picture shows insulin. However, we need to move on to what we call secondary structure. So there's two different forms of secondary structure alpha helix, which is shown on the left, and then beta sheets, which are shown on the right. All of these different secondary structures are due to hydrogen bonds between the peptide bonds in the primary sequence. And so alpha helical structure, for instance, your hair and collagen are full of this. And then the beta sheets, a good example would be silk, uh, for instance, and in, you see in clothing made by silk moths. Then we have what's called the tertiary structure. So the tertiary structure are interactions between the different R groups are called in the amino acid. So you can have ionic bonds. Uh, and so this would be between R groups of different charges. Uh, we could have hydrophobic interactions. So for instance, in the illustration, we have two valines that are interacting with each other. Disulfide bonds are the only covalent bonds that are present within the tertiary structure. These are between two cysteine amino acids. And then we can also have hydrogen bonds, again, between the R groups of the amino acids. The final structure, which is illustrated by ATP synthase shown here, is what's called the quaternary. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar at looking at what are called these ribbon models, you will notice that the alpha helices look like spirals, and then the, the beta sheets they're called are indicated by arrows. So the quaternary structure is when there are different polypeptides that come together to form a functional unit. Obviously, ATP synthesis, synthase is an excellent example of this. So what are these different prosthetic groups? What does this mean? So again, these are very difficult to remove from a protein. However, their presence is integral to protein or enzyme function. So the first two types of prosthetic groups, we're not going to be covering in depth today, but they include uh, what are called metallo or metal groups. Um, and so for instance, there's an enzyme called tyrosinase. The, this enzyme catalyzes the first step in synthesizing the skin pigment melanin it requires a copper ion to be functional. The flavoproteins use flavin nucleotides. Uh, these are synthesized from nucleotides as well as a, a vitamin, in this case called riboflavin. An example is succinate dehydrogenase, an enzyme that occurs in the citric acid cycle and is bound to the inner mitochondrial membrane. The last floor, the glycoproteins, the lipoproteins, the phosphoproteins, and the hemoproteins will be exploring in a bit more depth. And I've given examples on this slide to kind of illustrate uh, how many different proteins are actually contain prosthetic groups. So the first one we'll explore is heme. This one, most people know from obviously the mo molecule hemoglobin. What we have is what's called a protoporphyrin ring. 
And in the middle of this ring structure, which is planar um, in its configuration, is an iron uh, ion. So it could be ferrous, it could be ferric, depending upon the function of the particular uh, molecule. And again, so the iron might have two different forms, ferric or ferrous. The functional side groups coming off can vary. So this shows heme B, but the other types of hemes will have different functional groups, which are at the sides of this molecule. Now, what's very interesting is that these, the heme is structurally related to chlorophyll and a, a vitamin B12. So I encourage you to look at chlorophyll and vitamin B12, realizing these are built from very similar structures. So cytochrome C uses heme. And so remember from what I told you, you can see that cytochrome C is a fairly simple um, protein, again, a single polypeptide, which has got several alpha helices in it, and the heme is in the middle. So the function of cytochrome C is highly conserved in all um, organisms that have an electron transport chain. In fact, it was probably one of the first proteins ever sequenced. Where we see it located is on the inner mitochondrial membrane, at least within eukaryotes. Um, so you can see that it's off to the the right of the electron transport chain and shuttles electrons from complex three to complex four. And so because the iron, remember, can switch between ferrous to ferric, we can easily move electrons using that iron ion that's in the middle of the heme molecule. Now, what's interesting is cytochrome C is the first uh, protein that shed during apoptosis, which again is programmed cell death. So its release indicates the cell is probably going to die. Most everybody's familiar with hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying molecule within our bodies. So hemoglobin is located in the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, and it's tasked with carrying oxygen. It's constructed from four globin proteins. So again, you can see the spiral shapes indicating that there's lots of alpha helices within the four different globin uh, proteins. And there's a heme group associated with each one of these globin chains. And so, the heme carries oxygen. Now you'll notice that the iron needs to be in the ferrous state in order to, for hemoglobin to be able to carry oxygen. And it's actually the heme itself that carries the oxygen molecule from your lungs to the rest of your body. Catalase. Now catalase is an enzyme. So in this case, we have that prosthetic group, the heme, which is necessary for catalase to be able to form its function. You will notice that its overall structure looks a lot like hemoglobin. And so there are four different polypeptides and you'll notice that there's a lot of beta and alpha helice structures within this. Each one of these uh, peptides contains a heme group. So remember, catalase is a very important enzyme. It turns out peroxides, like hydrogen peroxide, are extremely damaging to your tissues. Uh, peroxides damage specifically the cell membranes. So every time you pour that hydrogen peroxide on a cut, not only, unfortunately, are you getting rid of the bacteria cells, but you're also damaging your own. So what does catalase do? What it does is catalyze, as its name suggests, the destruction of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So when you see that bubbling reaction, it's actually oxygen being released from the bacterial cells and unfortunately your own cells as well. <clears throat> 
So it's present within all organisms exposed to oxygen. It turns out oxygen is actually a pretty dangerous molecule and easily forms superoxides and peroxides. So catalase, as I said, is found throughout all organisms. So again, it's gonna protect the cells from oxidative damage. Without the heme, this enzyme won't work. So as I said, prosthetic groups can not only be involved with enzymatic activity, as we see with catalase, um, but also might have other functions as moving oxygen, as we see with hemoglobin, or with transporting electrons like we see in the cytochrome, such as cytochrome C. Okay, so again, iron, at least within the catalase, is integral to the particular reaction. And its removal will mean that catalase can't work. So the next type of prosthetic group we need to explore are called phosphate groups. So phosphate, remember, is highly negatively charged. So on the upper left, we can see two different enzymes, a kinase and a phosphatase. So a kinase uses ATP and puts a phosphate group onto a protein. The phosphatase, as its name suggests, removes that phosphate group, returning the protein to its original structure. So phosphates um, are very important, as we'll see as we go through some of the functions about how this works. And I will use a particular enzyme to illustrate this. So again, kinases add the phosphate. So anytime you see the word kinase go, okay, this enzyme is going to phosphorylate something. A phosphatase again removes the phosphate groups. So at the bottom, you can see the three different amino acids which can become phosphorylated. Those are serine, threonine, and tyrosine. The yellow arrows indicate the location of where a phosphate group can be attached. All right, so where does this occur? Where do we find phosphate groups? Well, I want to give an example of an enzyme called glycogen synthase. This enzyme doesn't unfortunately have a very creative name, but a very descriptive one. Remember glycogen is a polymer of a lot of different glucose residues. Um, in humans, we store glycogen in two places, in muscle, the skeletal muscle, as well as the liver. So it's a, it's a very massive structure of glucose residues. So glycogen can be used for energy because it stores glucose and your body does need glucose to operate. So what does this enzyme catalyze? So in this case, it catalyzes a reaction where it's linking UDP glucose. It turns out sugars can't be added to anything without first being um, having a nucleotide attached to them. So this glycogen synthase added, adds UDP glucose onto glycogen, increasing the size of the glycogen by one glucose molecule and releasing UDP. All right, so how does phosphate work with this. All right, so glycogen synthase has two different forms, the active form and the inactive form. So the middle of this diagram shows the two different forms of glycogen synthase. So you'll notice the active form has no phosphates on it, where the inactive form has three phosphates attached. So you can think about phosphate as being the off switch. So if glycogen has phosphate groups on it, it doesn't work. All right, so the enzyme that puts on the phosphates to turn glycogen synthase off, actually there's two, casein kinase, which in turn phosphorylates glycogen synthase kinase, 
which then puts on the phosphate. So this is why it requires two ATP, one to turn on casein kinase, and the three then to phosphorylate glycogen synthase. This is turned off in the presence of insulin, which makes sense because if insulin is present, the body should be making glycogen because remember insulin indicates there's a lot of glucose around. So how do you turn glycogen synthase back on? That's using an enzyme called phosphoprotein phosphatase. So again, a phosphatase removes phosphate groups. And so in this case, you're using hydrolysis, remember, which is to break off the phosphates using water. It turns out that this phosphatase is increased by insulin as well as glucose, which makes sense because you want to store glucose in the form of, of um, glycogen. However, it's turned off by glucagon and epinephrine. So later on, um, in another unit, we'll be looking at communication, cell communication, and just remember those hormones were to communicate the outside influences on cells. The next, uh, in this case, prosthetic group, we need to look at our carbohydrates. And so in terms of cells, we see often carbohydrate chains both on lipids and proteins, but let's talk about the protein side. So in this diagram of a cell membrane, we can see carbohydrates attached to proteins that are embedded within the cell membrane. Um, and so these carbohydrates are very important in, for instance, determining self. In other words, what makes you, you, oftentimes will be dictated by these different carbohydrate chains. So types of glycoproteins. Well, the first type are, are where we might have a peptide with different linkages on them. So there are a lot of different types of sugars. So in this diagram with the glycoproteins, we can see that we have what are called N-linked and O-linked carbohydrates. So the N-linked are linked to asparagine residues. And so these might contain sugars like N-acetylglucosamine and mannose. Or we can have sugars that are linked to threonine or serine residues, again, which will have sugars that are different than the ones that are um, the N-linked ones. But then there are some extremely large proteins that are present outside the cell. These are huge. And unfortunately, this illustration doesn't have the long chains of carbohydrates that could be present. These are called proteoglycans. And so some of these names you may have heard before, like heparin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate. Uh, proteoglycans are very important, for instance, in allowing your joints to move. They're really slippery. Um, and so you might see some of these come up in medications for, for joint health, for instance. And so they're very, again, they're made from a polypeptide chain with long, long chains of these carbohydrates attached to them in repeating units. So look at, let's look at heparin sulfate, for example. So in heparin sulfate, we have repeating residues of glucuronic acid and glucosamine alternating. Unfortunately, one of the things that's been in the news a lot recently are, is COVID-19. This virus has glycoproteins that are called spikes. And so a lot of the pharmaceutical companies are very interested in this because glycoproteins elicit a strong immune response. So some of the manufacturer of the vaccines are looking at these glycoproteins and whether or not we can make vaccines to protect against these spike proteins to prevent the virus from binding to our own cells. All right, so just keep in mind that glycoproteins, as you can see, aren't just found in 
uh, eukaryotic or prokaryotic organisms are also found in viruses. One of the other things that carbohydrates can do is to help transport proteins. So one of them is called mannose 6-phosphate, which is the structure shown on the left. So it's a sugar with a phosphate residue on it. What's the big deal? Well, it turns out all of the enzymes that are going to be targeted for the lysosome are tagged. In other words, they have a mannose 6-phosphate attached to them. And so if the enzymes are lacking this tag, they will not get sorted into the lysosome. So how does this work? So at the top part of the diagram, you can see that there are these mannose 6-phosphate uh, receptors that are present in the Golgi complex. These bind to the newly synthesized lysosomal enzymes and then will bind to the mannose 6-phosphate tag and then it can be moved into a transport vesicle where it can be um, sorted into a lysosome. Okay, and remember that's the primary lysosome which will contain all the lysosomal enzymes. The other place it can go is it can dump some of these enzymes to the outside of the cell. So what's really interesting is a cell can recycle the lysosomal enzymes because they have the mannose 6-phosphate tag and because there's a receptor for the mannose 6-phosphate present on the cell surface. So the enzymes can be endocytosed back into the cell to be reused. So again, recycling is one thing that can occur with these lysosomal enzymes and it's due because there's that carbohydrate prosthetic group, mannose 6-phosphate. The next thing to consider are lipids. Now there can be lipids attached to these uh, different proteins. One is called um, glycosphyls, glycosphyl phosphatidyl and acetyl or GPI. This is a huge structure, but you will notice that there's fatty acids that are, that are attached to this rather massive structure and then attached to the protein. So this allows, these GPI allows these proteins to be anchored onto the cell membrane. All right, so in this case, lipids can act as anchors. Another form is called the isoprenoid group. As, uh, so an example is shown at the Farnesyl group. You'll notice that this has a lipid-like structure and in, just so you know that isoprenoids are also used to make cholesterol. So it is a lipid and it's attached to the protein through one of the cysteine residues. And then we can also have some proteins that are attached to a 16 carbon fatty acid called palmitic acid. All right, so what do lipids do and why are they important? Well, as I think you can see with the GPI, they can act as anchors or that's also true with the Farnesyl groups. So where is there a problem, it turns out, with these Farnesyl groups? I wanna talk about a genetic condition called Hutchison-Gilford progeria. Um, this causes rapid aging during childhood. Uh, so the appearances of these children is that they're very short in stature. The failure to thrive means that they don't grow very well. They lose all their subcutaneous fat. They exhibit hair loss. But when you look at the cells under their cells underneath the microscope, what's very noticeable is that the nuclei appear blebby. So if you look at your cells underneath a microscope, the nuclei should appear like a nice kind of round or oval shape, very smooth in appearance. But when the cells from progeria patients are looked at under a microscope, the nuclei appear kind of misshapen. Um, and so as a result, due to these misshapen nuclei, the cells have trouble going through the process of mitosis, which can explain the lack of growth in these um, children. 
what's the root cause? Well, it turns out that there's a mutation in something called lamin A. So the lamins act like scaffolding. So in our nuclei, the lamins create the scaffold that supports the nuclear envelope. In other words, that, that double membrane that surrounds your chromosomes. All right, so if something is wrong with a lamin, how does this affect and explain the blebiness? What happens is that if we look at the lamin protein, when it's first synthesized, it's really long. It gets attached to one of those farnesyl groups. And then the, uh, then the protein is cleaved. So if you look on the right with a normal lamin A processing, you can get the cleavage and you'll notice that that farnesyl group is cleaved off from the mature lamin A molecule. If you look at the Hutchinson-Guilford progeria syndrome, you will notice that that cleavage doesn't occur. That's because of, of the mutation. So the protease that recognizes the cleavage site doesn't recognize this particular protein. And so as a result, that farnesyl group stays attached and the resulting protein is called progerin. All right, so if we look at a diagram of what the nuclei look like, what we can see is that why the blebiness. Well, normally the nuclear lamina should, as I say, provide a smooth scaffolding to support the nuclear envelope. What happens in progeria is that because the progerin has that farnesyl group attached, the lamins don't line up properly. So you get these blebs occurring and the nuclear pores end up clustering together when they should be spread out throughout the nucleus. So the blebbing can be explained by the improper removal or lack of removal of that farnesyl group. Normally when that farnesyl group is there in the normal case, it allows for the lamins to come together and then cleavage to occur of the normal protein, allowing for the proper construction of that nuclear scaffold. So thank you very much to listening to my presentation about protein prosthetic groups. I hope you learned something today. And again, I'm so happy to be part of the AP biology community. Thank you.